so now we are coming to uh, Dr. Perjulin from the uh, MECFS uh, clinic at Stuarsson Dahl in Stockholm. It's a rehabilitation uh, center. And it's from there you have done your study with uh, some fancy neuroradiology or something like that, isn't it, in this disease? <laughs> Very much welcome, Per. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. I am. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Let's see. Yes. Uh, I can start. Uh, my name is Perjolin. I'm a senior physician at the Neurological Rehabilitation Clinic at Stora Skandal. I have an image here and also have an academic affiliation to Karolinska Institutet. And, ah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm a specialist in rehabilitation medicine, and my research background is in neuroimaging in cognitive disorders like Alzheimer and also traumatic brain injury and stroke. Um, and since some years now also MECFS. Uh, and first a few words about the, the ME Polyclinic at Stora Sjöndal Foundation. It started 2015. Uh, at the Neurological Rehabilitation Clinic. And the Neurological Rehabilitation Clinic at Stora Sjöndal has been uh, is an, driven by the non-profit foundation, inpatient and polyclinic neurological rehabilitation since the 1970s, uh, funded by Stockholm County Council uh, for patients with stroke, Parkinson, MS, brain tumors, epilepsy, etc. And the ME Polyclinic is also funded uh, by the Stockholm County Council. And, and the... Oh, let's see. There is the... Okay, uh, and the county provides public health care for around 2.2 million inhabitants in Stockholm, and also uh, we accept patients from all over Sweden, but we have limited resources, of course. Uh, and we provide, we are to provide, that's uh, decided by the Stockholm County Council, uh, you heard Eva Bolin previously, uh, to provide specialist care, diagnostic evaluation, treatment, and rehabilitation for patients with suspected or confirmed MECFS. And the diagnosis is to be based on the Canadian criteria, which largely overlap with uh, this IOM uh, criteria, you can say. And now, we're very happy there's, uh, under this uh, funding by Stockholm County Council, there's now another clinic with the same view on MECFS, so yet just open. Uh, that's very good for the patients, we believe. And we are currently five physicians specialized in neurology, rehabilitation medicine, family medicine. And we also have a nurse, occupational therapist, physiotherapist, psychologist, and a counselor, social worker. And uh, we are to do research in collaboration with Karolinska Institute. And we have started some research in collaboration uh, with other researchers we have heard today. Let's see. So I will hopefully come back to that. I will, I will talk about neuroimaging in MECFS, and I will focus on... I'm moving around too much. Can you hear me? No? Now? Okay. Um, I will focus on mainly three methods. One is called fluorodeoxoglucose Positron Emission Tomography, that's a long name, FDG-PET for short, which is a clinical routine method now in, in hospitals, mainly in oncology, but it, you can ac also examine the brain. And functional magnetic resonance imaging, especially a method which has evolved the latest years, where you non-invasively measure the cerebral blood flow, both absolute and relative. Uh, uh, and also PET examination, also this positron emission tomography, where you can look at inflammation in the brain. Sorry. And I will go back a little to the basis of, of functional imaging, especially what the basis of functional imaging is that neural activity is tightly coupled to regional metabolism and blood flow. And uh, 
what we see using FTG PET or functional MRI is due to that the, the brain electrical activity demands a lot of energy and the brain is quite a, a special organ. It is just 2% uh, of the body weight but consumes 20% of the energy a given time and 20% of the blood flow goes to the brain. And it's unique in another way, it's the regional blood flow within the brain is regulated by the regional energy demand of the neurons, not by the systemic blood pressure. And regional brain metabolism blood flow is strictly coupled to the neural electrical activity, at least in the normal healthy brain. It's different if you have a stroke, for instance, this coupling can become disturbed. Uh, and this is a basic picture. This is supposed to be one neuron. And this is another neuron, and they communicate with another via neurotransmitters. And it, studies have shown that uh, most of the energy consumption in the brain goes to restoring this postsynaptic potential of the receiving neuron. That's seven, around 70% of the energy. So it's electrical signaling between the, the cells that, that use a lot of energy. And it's coupled then to the regional uh, blood flow, which increases when the nerve cells in the region are more active. And here is an image. If you look at this FTG PET, for example, if you look at the image to the right here, is an, a slice through a uh, PET examination of an adult brain. Here is the frontal part of the brain. Here is the posterior part, visual cortex basal ganglia here and frontal lobe and the, the green areas or rather the more going from black to blue to green to red you have higher glucose metabolism and you can see in, in the cortex in the gray matter you have high energy consumption due to the neurons talking to each other and if you look at the six-year-old child you can see it's much more red and that's because the glucose consumption is twice the level of an adult. And if you look at the slice, a uh, microscopic image of the cortex of a person of this age, you can see that the six-year-old child has much denser networks of neurons. That's why the metabolism is uh, twice. And this is a period where you learn a lot every day of language. And so if the brain is active in a different way and training these neurons and you lose some neurons. And uh, and you can see this with PET examination. And so PET examination is sensitive to the number of neurons and the number of synapses in an area. And also sensitive to synaptic activity. Here is one subject examined twice at rest and another situation where there is a sound stimuli. And if you look here at the uh, temporal lobe, you have the center for uh, uh, auditory cortex, which increases the metabolism. Just if you compare rest to, and you can see it even as of the raw image, it's much redder, it's much higher glucose consumption and neural activity when you have a clear sound sti stimuli. Uh, and in Alzheimer's disease, which I've been working quite a lot in previously, you have First, you reduced activity, and later in the disease, reduced number of synapses and neurons. Here's a healthy control. You see this slice again with the frontal lobe and posterior part. And the Alzheimer patient have very low metabolism, especially in these posterior parts. Uh, and we did studies on, on a familial case of Alzheimer's where it's a mutation, so you know the family members with the mutation will get Alzheimer's. So you could follow. Uh, 21 family members, including initially non-symptomatic carriers that later developed Alzheimer's. And we could do multiple testing like MRI, blood flow, FTG PET, and cognition testing. And uh, what we could see that FTG PET changes seems to be very early in, in Alzheimer's disease. Before we could measure any cognitive decline or uh, structural brain changes. 
or blood flow changes. So the loss of synaptic function leading to reduced energy metabolism is probably a very early event in Alzheimer's disease. And FDG-PET is a very sensitive method to detect uh, even slight neuronal synaptic dysfunction. So here, here's one of these cases, completely normal structural MRI, but quite clear reductions in glucose metabolism. I have to, these findings are they're not specific, as a biomarker, it's not specific for, for a certain disease. The pattern can be typical, but it's uh, just a PET examination just tells you that the function is reduced. So, mm. And back to MECFS, uh, the, the clinical and scientific problem we have is that the ME diagnosis so far is based on clinical criteria. And standard laboratory tests usually are within normal limits. And standard performance tests, at least as a single location, uh, can often be within normal limits. And patients are often misdiagnosed as stress-related exhaustion. This uh, post-assertional malaise is not understood by the healthcare uh, or by insurance agencies. Uh, and patients are often recommended graded exercise therapy. To increase your physical activity, you will probably improve. But the patient gets worse. Uh, and patients are often told, we hear this every day, all tests are fine, you have no medical disease. So this is still the everyday picture for us. Uh, let's see. And w we got some, in this is also preliminary data, uh, uh, but uh, we started to refer some patients to FDG-PET, mainly to exclude early signs of neurodegenerative disorder, for, because some patients have quite clear cognitive uh, problems uh, in selected patients. But these patients were very thoroughly investigated, and there were no findings indicative of neurodegenerative disorder, clinical routine MRI normal in all cases, and Many of these patients were also investigated at the memory clinic with lumbar puncture and so on. No abnormalities found with these routine tests. Uh, but to our surprise, around seven of the 10 first MA patients show regional hypometabolism in FDG-PET, which is it's not, not uh, on an individual level. So, and we looked at the literature, we in fact found some studies one, this is the latest one from 2003, with quantitative analysis that show that more than 50% of patients, uh, and these were CDC criteria, for, but, uh, but anyway, uh, more than 50% of MECFS patients had uh, de detectable hyperperfusion areas. It, I think these authors were a bit disappointed because it was not a specific area, a clear pattern in the brain. It was different areas in different subjects. But if you look at individual level, more than 50% of the patient had significant or pathological reductions in their brain function. And, and this need to be, I believe this need to be further studies in larger studies and to understand the relationship between this and immunological changes, for example. And this is one patient example where the FTG PET shows reductions in lateral temporal parietal cortex bilaterally. This is a clinical routine method where the radiologists do a visual rating and there's also a standardized quantitative comparison to a normal reference material. This is the image, like I saw before, this slightly low perfusion here in the temporal lobe. And here is the statistical analysis compared to the control group they have in their system. And the blue areas here show significantly reduced uh, metabolism. And this uh, could be reversible. Like I said, it's a, function, it's a measure of functions, but it's an objective measure of significantly reduced regional brain function. So... Uh, uh, the limitations of FDG-PET is it's invasive because you have to uh, inject intravenously a radioactive tracer and the radiation limits the number of repeated examinations, one to two a year, especially in research. In clinics, it's, it's a bit different, but for research purposes, you have clear limitations. And it's quite expensive. 
even though it's now available through, because it's used a lot in oncology, whole body, FDG PET, but uh, it's still expensive. Uh, but we believe that there are new MR techniques, magnetic resonance imaging technique that might be comparable to FDG PET, especially a technique called arterial spin labeling MRI, uh, where you put a magnetic contrast over the vessels in the neck, which uh, labels the water molecules in the blood flowing up to the brain. And then you can measure both absolute and relative blood flow. And here you can see an image which is, shows you the same finding as with FTG PET, as blood flow and glucose metabolism are closely coupled. So in adults, you have half the blood flow per uh, volume of tissue per minute compared to the children, the same picture as you can see with FTG PET. Uh, the problem is this requires 3T MRI, which is, if, of course, is clinical routine now, but uh, the technique is, uh, is becoming clinical routine just now, I would say. Uh, but it hasn't been. Especially they still, I, I don't know, they don't have in the radiology department the same standardized quantitative evaluation as they have with FDG PET for these MRI techniques yet. So, let's see. Um, but I've been involved in studies with Professor Detter's group in the University of Pennsylvania. He was one of the first developing the ASL technique. Uh, in, uh, and we compared FDG PET and ASL MRI in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, ASL MRI gave the same or even better information on, on brain pathology in, in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we did a study on drug effects on the brain with ASL MRI, and this is interesting because with it, there is no radiation, so you can repeat this examination uh, as many times as you like. Here we put the healthy control subjects who receive either placebo or amphetamine in the scanner 10, ten times during one day. Uh, and we, you can see the difference here between the two groups after one hour, uh, after those two hours, three hours, four hours, six hours, you can see that there's a blood flow reduction after taking amphetamine. And we could uh, do a model of the plasma levels of the drug compared to the effect on the brain. So it's a, it's a quite interesting technique where you could follow processes in the brain in, in a new way. Mm. And we did some studies of mental fatigue in mild traumatic brain injury, MTBI. Uh, and the, these patients often have a mental fatigue or fatigability that's quite similar to MECFS. They don't have the physical fatigability, but the mental fatigability is quite similar. And these patients often also have problems because standard CT and MRI often are normal. Uh, and they are also often questioned. The relation between their problems and the brain injury is often questioned. Uh, and also their mental fatigue is not, often not understood by healthcare or by insurance agencies. And there is a lack of good neuropsychologists that really can evaluate this type of mild cognitive impairment. So these patients have, in some respects, the same problem as ME patient. But in the latest years, I think, largely due to uh, American football players, uh, where there has been this debate, and also American soldiers that had experienced repeated head trauma. It has been clarified that even a single head trauma can lead to long-lasting cognitive effects, even though you don't see anything on a standard MRI. But, uh, and, and we have used these MR techniques to show that in MTBI patients with mental fatigue, they have a abnormal brain functional connectivity. There, there's a new method, which is operator-independent method to analyze functional connectivity in the brain, specifically in the thalamic area, where the, the, the way the, the brain, different brain regions talk to each other is disturbed in this patient group compared to controls. Uh, and we also, this is recently published, uh, where you can use this test because you can repeat it many times, the patient 
do this measurement of absolute blood flow during a 20 minute uh, vigilance test in the scanner. And uh, we see that both the performance, the cognitive, actual cognitive fatigability, and also the subjectively perceived fatigue, uh, they are related to disturbances in neural networks in the thalamic and frontal areas. So and we are very interested, of course, in applying these techniques. And that's what we started now in, in ME patients. Uh, to see if the, the mental fatigability has a similar correlate in ME patients. And there are other studies uh, showing, for example, blood flow reductions in ME-CFS, this American group. Oh. Yeah, I'm moving too much. Uh, uh, using also this arterial spin labeling technique this is a couple of years ago. And uh, also connectivity has been shown to be disturbed in MECFS patients. So it's clearly a need for, for further and larger studies in this area. Uh, now I will uh, jump a little to more to inflammation and microglia. Uh, which you can also do neuroimaging on, but this is microglia, uh, that's immune cells um, that are activated in injury or inflammation of the brain. And here you see an image, uh, the green dots here are microglial cells, and the red are neurons from a rat brain. Oh, and you can do PET examination. You have ligands, that radioactive ligands that bind to activated microglia in the brain. And you can see inflammation in, for example, stroke and MS patients. This is from Banati's paper 2000. Show that these are microglia, they are resting, and then they become activated by uh, an injury or pathology. Uh, and here is a pa uh, stroke patient where you see activated microglia related to the area of a stroke. And it has been one study in ME patients from Japan, Watanabe and co-workers, who found signs of neuroinflammation in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome with this ligand, PK11195. Let's see if I have it. Ah, here's the image. The interesting is also the brainstem and thalamic area, which is quite interesting, uh, where they found this is a difference between the controls and the ME group. Uh, so this is quite interesting. But we know this ligand is... Uh, we did a study oops, on... On this ligand, it has a very low specific binding and very high variability, so it's, it's not really useful as a clinical tool. Uh, but there are new ligands now, which are more promising. Well, they also have their issues, but uh, there are some genetic differences in how the ligand behaves, but you can control for that to some extent. And there's a new ligand, one of them is called carbon-11 PBR28. It has high specific binding and good reproducibility. This is another one of our co-workers, uh, Dr. Grand Bay from radiology department at Karolinska, who did with his American co-workers a study on where you can see a diffuse cortical inflammation in MS uh, in areas that appear normal according to MRI. It's not just these classical inflammatory lesions, but you have an ongoing, more low-grade inflammation, which you can visualize with this sensitive technique. Okay. Here's an image of this. You can see that you have and higher uptake in several cortical areas in patients with MS that look normal on MRI, so it's quite interesting. Uh, and you can use this ligand with the PET group at Karolinska has used this, for example, to study effects of new drugs on brain inflammation. Here in, in Parkinson's disease, uh, a new drug that supposedly would diminish inflammation, brain inflammation in Parkinson's disease, they examined a group of Parkinson patients and controls and the Parkinson patient were put on this myeloperoxidase inhibitor drug for, I think, eight weeks. 
And the interesting thing is that even though they didn't get significant difference between the Parkinson patient and the controls at the baseline study, they could show clear reductions in the brain inflammation markers over time with the drug treatment. So you can see an image here, for example, there are two patient cases. Here is the inflammation marker before starting with the drug and then after four weeks and after eight weeks. So these techniques are very interesting also to follow the effects of treatment in, in, in brain disorders. So that would be interesting also when you do new treatment trials in MSCFS to see the effect on the brain. Uh, and so we have some research ongoing at Stora Kondal together with Karolinska. The MR techniques, the functional MR techniques, and also this is collaboration with Jonas Blomberg at Uppsala to look at immunology. And also we have planning together with the nuclear medicine department to follow up on these F clinical FTG findings to do a systematic study on this to see if we can replicate the previous American study. And we have some planning phase for a study on microbiome, which are together with the researcher Sharam Lavasani in Lund, and also to look at both ME and MS patients together with Dr. Karen Bauer from Karolinska Hospital. And we have an ongoing study on microglial PET using this new ligand together with PET Center. We recruit some patients. This study was already ongoing. It's Professor Evan Gord, Professor of Infectious Diseases in Umeå, and who has previously had the ME Polyclinic at Huddinge Hospital, yes. and Dr. Watanabe from Japan, and together with the Karolinska Pet Group. So, uh, to summarize, I think this has been clearly shown that functional brain changes have been shown in MSCFS using FTG PET and MR MRI, functional MR techniques. Uh, but there, of course, there is a need of further studies. Oops. It's really quick, this one. And FTG PET can already today provide standardized quantitative assessment of brain dysfunction in individual patients with ME CFS. But there, are, there is a need for, to, for further studies to really define the clinical role because this is a quite expensive and invasive examination. Uh, and new fMRI techniques are potential markers for neural pathology related to mental fatigue and cognitive dysfunction and might give similar information as FTG PET on a clinical level, and then there is no radioactivity involved. It's much more clinically feasible to use as a routine method for with, when you investigate MSCFS patients. And I think I'm convinced that new methods for MRI and PET will be very important to understand the pathophysiology and, of MSCFS and to evaluate biological effects of, of new treatment trials. Yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you, Per, and uh, for this new technique, which is in development, I suppose. It develops yeah. all the time, I suppose. So. so, any questions? If I ask you, we, you, you did experiments with amphetamine. Yeah, uh, but uh, are these ADH uh, individuals that receive amphetamines or are they normal? In this study, the idea was to that was when I worked for a pharmaceutical company. So the idea was to have a tool to evaluate new drugs for AD, for for example ADHD mm -hmm. in a consistent way. You could do this pharmacodynamic modeling and see the effect on. It. But these were healthy controls. So you gave them uh, narcotics. Yeah. Okay. And the interesting thing is that most of them found it very unpleasant. Oh, uh, yeah. The clinical trial unit, one subject, they didn't even uh, let him home in the evening. He, he felt so anxious. Okay. So well, you can find uh, <laughs> but I think it's not, many individuals. It's not, that, so that. the conclusion was uh, taking 20 milligrams amphetamine and lying in an MR scanner whole day. It's not fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anyhow, there are many people that like amphetamine too. <laughs> yeah. You know that. Uh, I wonder, you had one more. You showed a new drug that had excellent effects on the PET scan uh, inflammation picture when it comes to Parkinson's disease, isn't it? Yeah. So 
So you saw a good effect there. Did you also say so a good clinical effect? No, corresponding to this. Uh, 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 the, that's finally the the important thing, isn't it? If they yeah. get better, did they get? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, is this was just a couple of years ago, so I, I don't know how far this project has gone, or if okay. it's still within the company. But the the idea with this was that you need, they call it, uh, kind of proof of mechanism. And the problem is doing studies on disease-modifying drugs in Parkinson's disease. You do to do, do five-year-long studies. Ah, okay. So, but if you can prove at an early stage that you affect the mechanism you're after in the brain, then you can, okay, now we're more confident. We go into larger clinical studies. But if you don't see an effect in the brain on inflammation, then you, yeah, you probably stop the project. So, so I, I ho I still, it's uh, still in development. Uh, any question from the floor before we start the general discussion? Yes, please. Uh, I'm Katarina Matsum, I'm a medical reporter. Uh, I was just wondering, this Parkinson drug, has it ever been tried on ME patients? No. Not that you know. Do you think no. there's a chance of, that it would have effect on ME patients? I don't know, maybe to the other immuno, because it's a myeloperoxidase inhibitor, it affects, when you have this model with um, peritonitis, I think, when they're in the preclinical, I don't know what you say. Um, from what I know, um, it will only work when you've got actual degranulation of the neutrophils, mm -hmm. which are likely to occur in really frank inflammation, which I don't think was happening in MECFS from yeah but I haven't do you know if anyone has looked because that you can look at these MPO levels in the blood and it's increased in have someone looked in for that for in ME someone asked me that <laughs> sorry <laughs> actually someone did ask me that and we've been looking uh, I've actually looked at it in various other diseases mm -hmm. and it's quite easy to do and there's been one study unreported, um, and there was no difference from normals in MECFS, but it was not very well done study. It could, should be repeated, possibly, but yeah. neutrophils, I don't think, have any role. Yeah. Who knows? May not. And one problem, I think, with MECFS for drug companies, like the, for, for these types of drugs, for example, there's a lot of Parkinson animal models that the drug company use before they go into clinical trials. And they are not perfect, but still you have this. So where they can show, for example, in this Parkinson model, you have increased levels of MPO in the brain and so on and so forth. So you have step by step. And that's the problem with ME. There is no, not good, no good animal model as far as I know. Uh, yeah, more questions? Do you know, this is a, not, uh, you know, how early in life you can get ME? How young can the children be before, which is the earliest time that you can, can uh, diagnose yeah. myalgate and cephalato? I personally know a physician who said he's seen a child four years old who, who he could diagnose as having ME. Four years old, okay, yes. Because the mm -hmm. the brain looked quite different in a six-year-old than in an adult, isn't it? Completely yeah. different. As an immunologist, I would more think of a selection theory. You have all the possibilities in the beginning and then you select those that you need. Yeah. But, uh, that's a, oh. That's probably part of the, the change in the brain. Select the most important neurons and yeah, train them right. somewhere, and then you have it. Uh, there is uh, great similarities between the brain and the immune system, isn't it? The brain is, they have very many things in common, really. Okay, then uh, shall we move over to the uh, general discussion then? And um, we thank Per for this uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you.